MGA model of car. Uh, the car was built from 1955 to 1962 by the British Motor Corporation in Abington, England. Apparently the cars were developed for Le Mans starting in 1955. However, um, there was such a uh, issues going on apparently at BMC headquarters that the cars were basically developed ready to be going to production but they were held back. Uh, that's why the TF was developed and um, it was kind of like a scape or kind of like a, uh, a stopgap measure until these cars were developed and put on the road. Um, in 55 there was a horrible accident at Le Mans and consequently that kind of put things back a little bit as well but they, uh, they eventually uh, hit the market and um, became very very popular. It was the first model with the streamlined look as opposed to the typical T-series car which had a straight grille and a slab gas tank on the back. Uh, basically there were competition for the Austin Healey. Um, some people compared them to a poor man's Jaguar because they, they really were the first car that uh, exceeded 100 miles per hour, uh, first MG that exceeded 100 miles per hour. Um, the 55 to, six, the 55 to 59 MGA were 1500 cc's and um, they came with uh, drum brakes front and back um, and a 1500 engine. That was probably kept them going until 1960 when they came into the 1600 model uh, which is similar to the one behind me and it had disc brakes on the front and drums on the back. Uh, it came in a coupe model as you can see uh, for those uh, cooler evenings when um, people wanted to have uh, something a little bit more fixed head coupe with something a little bit more over a little bit more protection had roll down windows and as you can see they had a real delicate looking uh, door handle on them that are very very unique only to the to the uh, the coupe model in about 1959 they also came out with a twin cam model uh, very very rare very unique car uh, basically developed for racing um, the engines, basically, the, unfortunately, the engines were so finely tuned that the average person on the street uh, just couldn't kind of maintain the cars, so they got themselves a very nasty reputation and uh, for unreliability. And so, consequently, by 1960, there were no more twin cams were made. Now they've become a very, very sought-after cult car. Uh, so, if you have a, an MGA twin cam, uh, you, you should consider yourself a very, very fortunate in, individual. The cars are, uh, are beautiful, they certainly keep up with modern traffic on the road, they're reliable, they are fun to drive, they're easily maintained, and um, if you've never been in one, see somebody and uh, hopefully you'll get into one. The North American MGA Register, by the way, registers all these cars. We have over 2,100 members, we've registered 6,500 cars, there are 101,000 cars ever made, MGAs, which was the very first time that a British company actually made more than 100,000 cars. So we're very proud of that. Okay, this is number 43, one of the two cars entered by the factory at Sebring in 1961. Uh, this particular car was driven by two British drivers, Sir John Whitmore and Peter Riley. Uh, Whitmore went on to race Cobras and uh, GT40s for Ford later at Le Mans. Uh, Riley was a routine uh, rally driver in the Big Heelys for the factory. The car finished second in class. Its sister car, number 44, was first in class. Out of a 62 car field, they finished 14th and 16th overall, 1-2 in class. Uh, the best finish for A's at Sebring during their factory entries. Uh, the car itself is basically a pushrod engine car. It's a very special engine. It's a the block uh, is actually a special casting. It has no water passages between the head and the block. Uh, the block and head are lapped together and all water is routed out the back of the head into the block. Uh, it ran larger carburetors. Basically, the factory uh, special tuning features of, of most cars. Nothing terribly exotic, but uh, enough to be sure that it would last 12 hours. The entire engine and virtually everything on this car is safety wired. It's either cross-drilled with a split pin, something on there to keep it from vibrating coming loose. Uh, MG's key to winning at Sebring was staying in one piece and making it to the finish. Uh, the car itself completed 178 laps at Sebring. At that time it was five and a quarter miles a lap. So, uh, and it averaged just under 80 miles an hour speed for the entire 12 hours. 
In 1959, the factory raced roadsters with aluminum hardtops on them. For 60 and 60, uh, 61 and 62, they raced coupes. They felt that the extra weight of the roof was worth it because of the added aerodynamics. Um, and it was just a little easier to do. To save weight, they took out the uh, wind-up mechanisms for the doors, which are quite heavy. They took the glass out of the car. Only the windshield is glass. The side windows and the whole rear window are plexiglass. Uh, there are a lot of aluminum panels in the car to make up on weight. The front balance is alloy. The inner splash panels, the transmission tunnel, the rear battery box cover, all are made out of aluminum to lose a little bit of weight. And everything is heavily cross-drilled. Uh, the front suspension, the chassis has got a lot of cross-drilling in it to take out weight. They had to be within 5% of production weight, so they couldn't go overboard with aluminum bodies. Uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, the expense would have been worth it. They had to make it back up to 5% of production weight. Uh, the car ran on a, um, was able to run on a single set of brake pads for the race, which is one of the reasons they were able to win against the sunbeams. Sunbeams were burning up their brakes pretty quickly and had to keep coming in to change pads. They were able to go through the whole 12 hours on one set of pads, and uh, they only had to change tires once. Uh, the car has a 20-gallon fuel tank, 20 U.S. gallon tank, 17 Imperial, and uh, twin fuel pumps in the boot, which is where the spare is kept, uh, along with the jack. And um, to keep the drivers cool, on the cowl there is an air intake with a special cold air box that just vents cold air onto the driver's feet. Uh, also, all of the uh, plumbing of the car, the fuel lines, the brake lines, the wiring harness, are all routed through the rear bulkhead and run alongside the driver's footwell and stay inside the car so that stones and so forth couldn't come up and hit it. In the front end, these two holes, a lot of people thought for a time that those were for brake cooling or something of the sort. They're to sight holes so you can see the quick lift jacks. This car has quick lifts that you just roll the trolley underneath and push down, lifts the whole front end. There's also quick lift setups at the rear. Um, the uh, minis that were raced at uh, Monte Carlo use these same plastic covers it used to be traditional to tape over the headlights, but they came up with these plexiglass covers that they could leave on all the time, they didn't have to remove them. And it has a pair of driving lights set up in the front. Um, it uses the twin cam disc brakes all around, uh, the knockoff disc wheels. Uh, most of the rest of it is fairly stock. Um, different wiring harness, different uh, suspension components, spring rates are different. But other than that, it's a pretty stock car but uh, you can still take it on the road and have it for a drive. Ten years ago, I bought this MGA from one of my friends who used to race it. He was the original owner, Bob Burns, and he raced it from 62 to 72, and I bought it in 1984 when he decided to move to California. And I had a piece of racing history that I knew well, I knew Bob well. Uh, never thought I would get his old race car, but it essentially was streetable because he was a club racer. It was a car you could drive on the road as well as uh, race on a weekend. He had taken the roll bar out and of course there were no fuel cells or anything back then. So I drove the car, oh, on the road up until uh, this uh, last year. And Joe Tierno, my good friend Joe said, gee, the 40th anniversary of the Collier Cup is coming. So. What did I need to do? Because for me, historically, I was down here when the Collier uh, brothers were racing, and through all of the, the 60s, I was flagging, and the Collier Cup, even though it wasn't for all MGs at the time, uh, at that time, uh, was something that I had worked on, and historically, I wanted to get into it. I had an old race car that raced through in the Northeast, so I modified the car to its, its basic modifications, roll bar, fuel cell, electrical system, and I made some mechanical modifications so that the car would be a little safer. But essentially, I'm running the same race car that Bob Burns ran in the 60s with the same uh, engine that came out of the factory in Abingdon. I've made no modifications other than pull a muffler off to, to the, uh, the driveline. And uh, essentially, that's all I've done is put all the safety modifications that are required. And the engine and the transmission and the rear end and the brakes are all stock, whatever came out of Abingdon and whatever Bob raced uh, this engine uh, uh, in the enduro races that he was in, uh, it's pretty. Sad. I've driven this car to <clears throat> oh, on trips of a thousand miles on the road, so it's really pretty much a street car. But at Watkins Glen, it just runs as sweet as I would like it to run.